Mr. Vice Chancellor, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 11th uh, annual Fulbright Distinguished Lecture to be given this year by Professor Devi Sridhar of the University of Edinburgh. Professor Irene Tracy, Pro Vice Chancellor, will introduce Professor Sridhar, but let me say a few brief words about this lecture series. Senator J. William Fulbright was an alumnus of Pembroke College and of this university. Arriving in Oxford in 1925 as a Rhodes Scholar to read history. He was taught by Ronald McCallum, who exerted an enormous, lifelong uh, intellectual influence on him. Professor McCallum went on to be Master of Pembroke, and Senator Fulbright was elected an Honorary Fellow of this college. Let me carefully distinguish Senator Fulbright's contributions as a statesman. The first is his support for the engagement of the United States in international peacekeeping and the United Nations, which led to the program of international educational exchange for students and scholars that bears his name. 75 years on, the Fulbright program is synonymous with the use of cultural diplomacy to deepen understanding between countries by bringing together people of all backgrounds to study, teach, or pursue important research and professional projects. The second is his willingness to dissent. He was the sole vote in the Senate against funding the McCarthy Committee, and he used his powerful voice and position to speak out forcefully against the Vietnam War. His book, The Arrogance of Power, is as important today as when it was written. That said, we equally recognize that there are negative and painful aspects to Senator Fulbright's other contributions. If I may quote from the Fulbright program, which makes this clear. His voting record on civil rights contributed to the perpetuation of racism and inequality in the United States. His segregationist stance and his opposition to racial integration in public places, including in education, are clear to, clearly at odds with the ideals of the Fulbright program and its legacy of over 390,000 distinguished and diverse alumni around the world. The Fulbright Distinguished Lecture was launched a number of years ago as a collaboration involving Pembroke College and the University's Department of Politics and International Relations, along with the United States UK Fulbright Commission, King's College London, the University of Edinburgh and the Lois B. Roth Foundation. We are delighted that this collaboration is now in its 11th year. Alongside the lecture series, Oxford and the Fulbright Commission have also established an annual visiting professorship, which will be held next by Professor Alison Brisk of the University of California, at Santa Barbara. We would also wish to acknowledge the great gener generosity of Roberta Foote Fulbright, one of Senator Fulbright's daughters, who died several years ago, and her daughter, Julia, herself an alumna of Pembroke. It is thanks in part to a generous legacy from Roberta and our other sponsors that this annual discussion continues. Previous speakers include two Nobel laureates, Harold Varmus for medicine and Joseph Stiglitz for economics. All of our speakers have shared Senator Fulbright's commitments to internationalism and the willingness to speak uncomfortable truths. I am sure that Professor Sridhar will continue that tradition. And what subject uh, might be more important and appropriate for to address tonight than hers? May I now introduce our Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Irene uh, Tracy. As well as being Pro Vice Chancellor, she's the warden of Merton College, Nuffield Chair in Anaesthetic Science and sits on the United Kingdom's Medical Research Council. 
Since completing her undergraduate studies and her doctorate of philosophy in biochemistry, she's been recognized as a highly respected neuroscientist who's worked at the forefront of neuroimaging and its application to understand acute and chronic pain. She was a founding member and director of Oxford's Center for Functional Magnetic Resonance Image of the Brain and head of the Nuffield Department of Neuroscience and, of course, a fellow here at Pembroke for 12 years. It is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Tracy back to Pembroke for this occasion. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Ernest, for the very kind uh, introduction, but also the invitation. Um, as Ernest mentioned, I am a former fellow and indeed very, very delighted to be an honorary fellow here at Pembroke. So the link continues. And it's really great to be back. Um, I'm utterly delighted and truly honoured um, as Pro Vice Chancellor this evening and on behalf of the Vice Chancellor to introduce and to welcome back herself tonight's speaker, Dr. Devi Shridhar. Devi is Professor and Chair of Global Public Health at the University of Edinburgh and Founding Director of the Global Health Governance Programme. Her background in public health interventions and her extensive research into the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has established her as a leading scientific voice in recent years. In 2015, she partnered with the Harvard Global Health Institute and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as co-chair of the Independent Panel on the Global Response to Ebola. The panel analysed the global response to the Ebola epidemic and investigated what reforms were needed to prevent and respond to pandemics and strengthen global health systems. Devi has also served on the board of Save the Children UK, the advisory board of the Financial Flows Programme at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and on the World Economic Forum Council on the Health Industry. She was research associate at Oxford's Centre for International Studies, visiting associate professor at LMU Munich, and guest lecturer at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Public Health Foundation of India. Earlier this year, she was included on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's list of new fellows. Congratulations. As I've intimated, Devi is herself a Pembrokean, having come here as a Rhodes Scholar in 2003, and after completing a bachelor's degree in biology and pre-medicine at the University of Miami, she became the youngest person in the US to be awarded the Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford. Following an MPhil in medical anthropology and a DPhil in social anthropology, she went on to join the University of Oxford Global Economic Governance Programme as a senior researcher, where she directed the Global Health Governance Project. She was then appointed as a postdoctoral fellow in politics at All Souls College, as well as fellow and associate professor in global health politics at Wilson College, and senior research fellow at the Blavatnik School of Government. Devi's research areas of focus include international health organisations, financing of global public health, and developing better tools for priority setting. Her work is conducted in close collaboration with ministries of foreign affairs, health and finance, with researchers in countries across the world as well as with policymakers in international institutions such as the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and UNICEF. Her books include Governing Global Health, Who Runs the World and Why, and The Battle Against Hunger, Choice, Circumstance, and the World Bank, chosen by Foreign Affairs as a must-read book in aid policy. She has also published extensively in Nature, Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, and the British Medical Journal and is an editorial board member for the Journal of Public Health. Devi is a regular media commentator on global public health issues. She has contributed to reports and participated in interviews for the BBC World Service, BBC News, Sky News, STV, BBC Radio 4 and 5, to name just a few. In 2014, she was listed among the top 100 global thinkers by Lo Spazio della Politica, forgive my Italian, for her work with the World Health Organization and on multilateralism. She won the Chancellor's Rising Star Award at the University of Edinburgh in 2017 and the Saltar Society's Fletcher of Saltoon Award for Contribution to Science in 2020. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has carried out extensive research, authored numerous articles and advised governments and public health organisations. In April 2020, she joined the Royal Society's Devla Group, which published research on the different approaches countries were taking to managing the pandemic and advised the UK's SAGE team. 
In the same month, she was added to the Scottish Government's time-limited expert group to help develop and improve the Government's plan for handling the pandemic. She's also a member of its subgroup on education and children's issues. A phenomenal CV, I think we can all agree, <laughs> and a most worthy individual to deliver this distinguished lecture. Therefore, I am delighted and honoured to welcome you back to Pembroke this evening, Devi, and we are all very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts about preventing the next pandemic. Please. So my earpiece has fallen out, but I'll put it here until the Q&A. And I asked them to give a very short introduction, um, which I guess was not adhere to, but thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction, a bit overwhelming. And it's a very special occasion to be here as the first time I arrived actually in Britain was here at Pembroke as a student in October 2003 and to come back um, now to be able to give a special Fulbright lecture which brings together the UK and the US, um, it's just absolutely perfect. And yeah, I'm a bit nervous because my PhD supervisor is here, Professor David Gellner, and my former boss, Professor Nairi Woods. And so of course, you know they're watching and I hope I can do them proud after all these years and them believing in me when I was struggling through my studies. So any of you students who are struggling early on, just keep going. If I've made it, anyone can make it through here. Um, so what should I talk about in my lecture, preventing the next pandemic? And I'm so used after the past year of talking in 30 second snippets because that's all you get. And you have the 30 second time that they gave me 45 minutes. I said, how am I gonna fill that time? And so I had to think quite deeply over what has happened over the past two years in international health, co health cooperation. And I just hope to share some of those thoughts with you. Some of them will be quite familiar. We've all lived through the pandemic together um, and hopefully it'll make you relook at some of the issues that we faced. So this all started in early 2020, when a virus originating in China spread across the world and affected the lives of all 7.9 billion people living on this planet. And different countries took drastically different approaches to managing this challenge. And it's hard to overstate what a significant thing this is historically. It's on par with the 1918 flu pandemic. How do we deal with this in terms of our response? I think Ed Yong, the science writer, put it best when he says, it's not a hurricane, it's not a wildfire, it's not comparable to Pearl Harbor or 9-11. Such disasters are confined in time and space. They happen and you recover. The SARS-CoV-2 virus will linger through the years and across the world. And I've often thought that if aliens wanted to run an experiment on us to understand our behavior and how communities organize themselves, governments organize themselves, the COVID-19 pandemic would be the ultimate test and revelation. Does humanity turn on each other? Do we come together? Where are the fracture lines of where society starts to break down? Infectious diseases bind us together quite tangibly. What I do affects you, what you do affects me. A lesson low and middle income countries knew very well given their long-standing experience of dealing with outbreaks on a daily or a weekly basis. And it's a lesson that richer countries like Britain and the United States painfully learned. But the pandemic also split us apart, and that's what I'm going to explore in today's lecture. SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that causes absolutely no symptoms in some people, and it is deadly in others. It pits the lives of the healthy who want to continue their daily routine against those who are vulnerable. It pits the young against the old, and the lives of essential healthcare workers, or generally you could say those who run our societies, against those who just want their normal services and lives back. So where does selfishness begin and end in a pandemic? What is the responsibility of richer countries to poorer ones? And how do our international institutions and architecture to try to enable cooperation and to advance humanity's collective interest? And what I'll come to at the end is how do we learn from the mistakes that we've made and prepare for the next one? But in order to look forward, we have to look back. So I'm just going to take a few minutes with some slides to look at how we got to where we are. This all started with one person being infected. And as we can see, the exponential growth continues. Every time we think that there's, we've reached the peak, the number of cases continues to increase. And again, this is just confirmed cases. It's not the actual true number of infections out there. What has been interesting to see is how waves have occurred across the world at different points. 
where we saw China, the first country affected, quickly bringing its epidemic under control. And then you see how Europe has been affected, in North America and the United States, and the large numbers in Asia, which are largely due to India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. And even till today, the pandemic is increasing as we're learning in Europe, numbers, daily records being set. So we're still in the middle of this as we try to look back at what is happening, as we've seen with Austria just going back into lockdown. So when did we start realizing something was happening that was unusual? Well, the WHO, through its notification service, sent this memo out to countries on the 5th of January 2020. And all that was known was that there was a cluster of cases and that these were tied to a market. They did not know if there was human-to-human -human transmission. They did not know what the fatality rate was. They did not understand fully even, was this a flu? Was it SARS? Was it MERS? What was this? And so this is what countries had to work with beyond, let's say, what their other agencies might be looking into. So you might wonder, why didn't those in the health security, security community start screaming at this point? And the reason is because there are so many emergencies and pathogens happening all the time. And that's something I think people are not aware of. The WHO in 2016, for example, had 60,000 disease alerts. They have to, from Geneva and with their regional offices, figure out which are the ones they want to investigate, follow up on, say, 300 events per month, and investigate 30, which means sending a team out. And of those 30, many remain localized events, many remain regional events. So I don't know if you've heard of plague in Madagascar, yellow fever in Brazil, and Lassa fever in Nigeria. These have all been happening. We just don't hear about them because they remain contained. So it's very difficult at an early point to know, is this going to become pandemic or is this gonna remain a localized and controllable event? And the reason we're seeing more and more of these is because of our interaction with animals. And most of what we get through zoonosis is from animal-human spillover. Animals come into contact with us, and then it spills over. And there are approximately, I think, 1.8 million viruses circulating in animals. So at a certain point, one of them comes into contact. If the transmission mechanism is human to human, and it's respiratory, meaning how we breathe and interact, it's in contrast to, let's say, Ebola, where you have to be in close with bodily fluids, and you have planes taking off all over the world. Wuhan is a major travel hub. It's a matter of hours days, weeks before you have it seeded probably to every part of the world. And this gives you an idea of how difficult it would be at a very early stage. We often can think about in the Q&A, we can discuss when could this have been stopped. It would have to be at a very, very early stage before it had even reached different parts of the world. So how do we try to manage this? Well, the World Health Organization was what its, its roots are in trying to contain outbreaks like this. It was established in 1948 as the chief director and coordinator of international health work in the United Nations. And outbreak response was the initial rationale for actually why even states got together in 1851. It was 11 European states and Turkey who came together because of increased trade and said, how are we gonna manage along our trade routes the spread of disease? The virus moves when people move and goods move. WHO's strengths are threefold. The first is technical, the second is normative, and the third is convening, and I'll talk through what these mean. So technically, it shares data between countries. So it just tells countries what is happening in one part of the world to another part of the world, it shares guidelines, key information. Normatively, it, has, it sets law. It's the only institution that can make states agree to do something, and in this case, it's the international health regulations which govern the response to outbreaks. So this is why China reported that it had this cluster of cases through its international health obligations to the WHO. And the convening is the World Health Assembly, where you have governments come together to agree, how are we going to resolve major issues? And I, I talk about this because when we talk about the breakdown, we have to talk about what WHO can and cannot do in these situations. So for example, it can advise countries, it can support them, it can encourage them, but it cannot go into countries and change policies. It cannot unilaterally go in and investigate the source of an outbreak. It cannot penalize bad behavior. And very rarely, probably not at all during this pandemic, have they actually said to any country, we're not happy with what you're doing. They might use subtle language and behind the scenes to do it, but they will never outwardly and explicitly say that we don't agree with that or we agree with that. It's a member state body, which is independent and neutral in its premise. With COVID-19, it's tried to bring these three roles together. So I'm looking at what has it done well? Well, technically, we've seen that it had daily press briefings from the 11th of January, I was listening in, where they brought together their strong technical team, and they shared with countries that this was coming and it was a problem. And what they told countries were you need to do is testing, contact tracing, isolation of carriers of the virus, physical distancing as needed, protection of health workers, get your PPE ready to go, ramp up your hospital capacity for patients needing care.
Director General Tedros said, and this is in January 2020, find, isolate, test, and treat, treat every case and trace every contact. Ready your hospitals, protect and train your healthcare workers, and let's look out for each other because we're going to need each other. The point is that from the 30th of January, when the public health emergency of international concern, this is the highest alarm bell you can ring, saying this is an emergency, they were saying to countries, be ready for battle. This is going to arrive on your shores. They managed to get a team into China on the 24th of February. A mission had to be agreed with the Chinese government to share what they had learned. And they came back and they shared what they had learned. If you look back at that report, it says epidemiologically who was affected, very accurate in terms of the hospitalization rate, and what the Chinese had done to contain the outbreak. And while they've been criticized for being quite kind to China in that report, you have to remember on the front of it, it says it's a joint China WHO mission. And access is sometimes preconditioned on verbally saying we agree with what is happening to get information out. That's diplomacy. Yet despite its best efforts, cooperation among countries broke down and exposed the limits of the WHO and the UN system as a whole. And I want to look at three ways in which we've seen the breakdown of cooperation. The first is on the strategy and response, what to do when this emerged. The second is in vaccine distribution. And the third is on the origins of COVID-19. Where did this virus come from? So if I turn to the first, how best to respond. I don't think anyone could have predicted how difficult a joined up strategy in Europe and North America would be. So when the virus first emerged, infectious disease modelers obsessed over the case fatality rate or the percentage of people who die after acquiring the infection. Seasonal flu, you might have heard, is this like the flu, kills approximately 0.1% of people who get this, and largely those who are over 70 or under five years of age. Contrast this with Ebola, which can kill 70% of people who get it and don't get treatment, or SARS, 11%, MERS, which is 33%. The WHO mission to China estimated, based on going out and collecting Chinese data, that this would be around 2 to 3%. This was revised downward after emerging evidence about asymptomatic carriers. The likely number is between 0.5 to 1.5%. So this might seem like small numbers. I've just told you about MERS and SARS and other diseases. But at a population level, what would it mean to let this virus go through? It would mean 5 million people dying in the United States. Here in Britain, a million. Close to 20 million in India. But the real picture is more complex because the deaths would be concentrated in the elderly and in younger individuals with comorbidities like asthma, heart disease, suppressed immune systems, diabetes, hypertension. And the other, I would say, one of the biggest surprises as we started to look at this data is that in countries like the US, here in Britain, Sweden, being of black or minority ethnic origin was a major risk factor. So in the United States, if you are black, you're nine times more likely to die of COVID. Here in the UK, people of South, or South Asian backgrounds, 20% more likely to die than if you were white. And while recognized as a problem, governments struggle to understand why exactly these groups were at higher risk. And in the even harder question, having been in the room of trying to advise governments, how exactly were you supposed to manage this and deal with this? When a suggestion was made to take all ethnic minority staff off COVID wards, just take them off frontline work, managers reacted that the NHS would collapse without their participation in the workforce. It was just not feasible. Existing inequalities within society having to do with socioeconomic status, race, and occupation became clear. And the three clear risk factors for death emerged coming from a deprived background, being from a racial or ethnic minority group, and having an occupation, such as being a cleaner, a security guard, a taxi driver, being a social care or healthcare worker. And often all three of those factors combined in regard to those who were key workers, who had to continue to show up for their jobs and do them regardless of safety and appropriate equipment. So instead of being the great equalizer, we're often told COVID has all brought us back to the same point, in fact, I think COVID-19 pulled back the tide and revealed one set of rules for one part of society and another for essential workers. And this is true whether you look at housing, whether you look at access to quality education when schools were shut, access to early testing and treatment, and involvement of actually who was involved in advising governments on different policies. And just on that, one of the I think, most valuable things we did in the Scottish Government Education Group was bring a head teacher on. And in every meeting, we ask her, how does this look for you as a teacher who's going to have to implement these policies? So coming back to governments, so this particular age profile and low mortality rate in comparison created a dilemma for governments on what strategy would you choose? And quite simply, there were only three strategies. If this was a disease clearly killing younger people in large numbers, imagine it was MERS and the strategy was clearly elimination, just get rid of it. 
However, because the disease largely affects elderly individuals and has a relatively low case fatality rate compared to other infectious diseases, this created misalignment among countries. So we ended up with a patchwork of, I would say, these three. Mitigation, and I'll talk a bit about what that means, suppression or control, and elimination, and an absence of a global cooperation and strategy that all countries are running towards the same thing. And to be fair, there were no silver bullets, there were no easy answers, there were no clever, clever models on what to do here. Every country was struggling. And there were relatively few choices. So all governments, I would say, their scientific advisors would have presented them these three and said, what do you want to do? So the first would be what we've seen New Zealand try for, and others, I would say, maximum suppression, what East Asian countries have attempted, would just try to get rid of the virus any time it rears its head. But this requires building a large infrastructure to monitor cases of the virus, identify hotspots. You need to give PPE to everyone, and most importantly, strict border controls. You've got to be very, very strict of not continually trying to seed it. Geography helps here, international mobility, what your economy develops on, how many land borders you have, and wealth, of course. So many islands went this way. I, I often joked in 2020 to be an island was a gift at the start. The second was you could say a bit simpler in terms of what to do is the path taken by parts of the United States, the UK and Europe, and it involved slowing the spread of the virus by largely using lockdowns, physically distancing people from each other. The government would issue guidance on this, shut down certain sectors, but the side effects of this path were very costly. It plunged these economies into recession, strained health and social care systems and created social unrest. And so I would say from the start, if you look at the modeling, you could see recurring cycles of lockdown because all you have to understand is your healthcare capacity line how many patients, your hospitalization rate, and you could see we would just be bouncing up and down for a while. And that would just be almost like a holding strategy for some kind of scientific breakthrough. The third and easiest path, you could always say, was a hands-off approach, which Sweden did attempt. The idea was that we would all have to get it anyways. The economy could remain open. And in the end, this was inevitable. So why delay the ine inevitability that these deaths were going to happen, but you could only delay it by six months or a year? And the cost of what it would do to the economy and society of putting in lockdowns was not worth it. Sweden tried this approach, but if you talk to Swedish advisors, they say they did not actually want to do this. They were more like control. And they say that in the end, they pivoted to look like much of Europe. So last winter, because of their winter wave, they passed emergency legislation to implement lockdowns of sectors. Right now, I'd say in the world, most countries look like in the middle, and we can talk about why that is that we've all ended up in the same place. All of these decisions had to be made in an initial vacuum of knowledge about COVID-19. So all the things we didn't know at the start were, what are the long-term health complications of survivors? How long does immunity last, if any? How many people were truly susceptible or might have immunity from other coronaviruses and the risk of mutations? And some leaders chose a risk-averse risk, risk averse approach. They didn't want to look through the fog and make a mistake. And others rushed in and were willing to gamble to preserve their economies and say, we're willing to risk it, that actually we can get through this. And I would say the focus on deaths at the start missed the real toll of the virus, which is the long-term damage it can cause to lungs, heart, kidneys, brains, long COVID, as we've heard. There are many people who are suffering from this, and I don't think we fully understand that toll. So given the degree of uncertainty, governments had to plan for several future scenarios. What could happen in the next 12 to 18 months? The first would be a scientific breakthrough. Think of an accessible vaccine or an antiviral therapy, which has happened. We now have two antiviral therapies that look like we can keep people out of hospital, and we now have several effective vaccines. But at the start, I don't think any health expert would have said to you, we are going to have a vaccine against this. We had never had a vaccine against a previous coronavirus. All bets were off on whether something would happen or not in that time frame. The countries that have bought time were vindicated when science has indeed presented a solution. Imagine we didn't get a vaccine or a therapeutic. What would have been the other option? Well, the countries that could might have taken on a resource intensive and grueling campaign to try to eliminate it, similar to how we dealt with smallpox or polio. The country by country elimination ending would fit with how SARS and MERS outbreaks were controlled. The reason they never became global pandemics was because of active case finding, tracing of contacts and isolation. But the big difference was that SARS and MERS make people quite ill, which means they stay home or go to hospital and don't pass it on to many others. The challenge with SARS-CoV-2 is you can feel completely fine and go out, asymptomatic carriers infect others. So in a sense, this plan has become more and more difficult and it's pretty impossible now with Delta and the new variants. And the worst scenario of all would be a repeat of the 1918 flu pandemic. The virus rips through the world, causing tens of millions of deaths as it has, a Darwinian culling of the elderly and the weak, an individual gamble if you're younger and maybe your genetic situation makes you more susceptible. And this unfortunately is already what has happened in most parts of the world. If you look at South Asia, look at Brazil and Latin America, 
and some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the others have been largely spared. So one of the most stark observations, I think, looking back on this, is how rich countries, particularly the US and the UK, floundered, while poorer countries such as Senegal, Ghana, Thailand, Vietnam, and even the state of Kerala and India did incredibly well. Even countries in Europe, look at Greece, Slovakia, and so on, could see this approaching and decided to listen to WHO advice and how best to prepare. Prior to COVID-19, when we looked at pandemic preparedness, the US was in the top spot with the UK close behind. But these rankings looked at capacity rather than less tangible qualities of things like political will, leadership, trust in government, the capa capability of senior politicians, and willingness to learn quickly from other countries and pivot based on new information. And I would say richer countries falsely believed they could treat their way through the pandemic. They went immediately into mitigation. In fact, even here in England, a deputy chief medical officer said she believed WHO advice as testing was not suited for the UK because the agency was for poor countries before praising the NHS's ability to offer world-class care regardless of the patient load. Similarly, President Donald Trump admitted that he tried to slow the testing down, to downplay the problem, and hoped that states and cities could manage and their ICU capacity would not be breached. However, both these countries realized that if 20% of people who get this require hospitalization, which were the initial figures out of Wuhan, and a third of them require ICU care, no health system in the world could cope with those numbers. And we saw that in Lombardy in Italy, which is one of the wealthiest and best resourced health systems in the world. And so all you have to do is for countries to look at this graph. And the challenge now is that countries like Mongolia, Ghana, and South Africa have had to listen for years to US and UK experts like myself flying in and advising them on how best to run their health systems and how best to respond to pandemics. And citizen scientists in these countries start to wonder whether do Western countries actually know best? Do they know how, how to run a health service and respond? Where will future leadership come from in global health? And I'll come back to that in the end. So I wanna move on to the second case of cooperation becoming fractured. Alongside the race for the vaccine, the scientific race, was the recognition that developing it was only half the battle, as we have now seen. Having adequate supply and distributing it equally across the world would be challenging, if not even more challenging. So recognizing this very early on in April 2020, institutions like the WHO and Global Fund and Gavi, they came together to say, how do we get ahead of this issue and, and plan for equitable access, not just to vaccines, but diagnostics and treatments. And you might have heard the term COVAX, which is the facility that was created. The target was to have enough vaccines to, that COVAX, this multilateral facility, to protect at least 20% of every single country's population, starting with those most at risk, such as health and social care workers and vulnerable groups. This was estimated to be at least 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. And the basic idea was to share the risks and benefits of developing and producing vaccines across countries by pooling the financial resources to develop vaccines, purchasing these at scale, investing in manufacturing, so building factories even before the science had been finished, and then already agreeing on where these vaccines would go. And what they did early on, which I think was really a great innovation, was survey the landscape. There was like 200 promising candidates out there, identifying which were the 15 or 20 they wanted to support, work with manufacturers to get production up, have collective purchasing power to try to get prices down, and start trying to decide which countries would receive this. But as trials started to show promising results, rich countries started pre-ordering vaccines in the summer of 2020. This was not only to ensure access to first doses, but to show manufacturers what a large market there would be waiting. This was gonna be profitable if you could actually make a successful vaccine. And this was quite an exceptional move by countries. This is the first time in Britain that they had ordered a drug or vaccine before it was approved, before actually we even knew the final trial data. So globally, enough vaccine doses were purchased in the summer of 2020 to cover more than 80% of adults everywhere. However, this was unequally purchased. High-income countries could vaccinate 245% of their populations, and the US, EU countries, Canada, pre-purchased doses for up to six times their population. But they also paid much less for these. For example, the EU paid $2.15 for each dose of AstraZeneca, while South Africa had to pay almost double that. Dr. Tedros of the WHO could see this happening, and he warned against this vaccine nationalism in that summer. He said, we need to prevent this happening. While there's a wish among leaders to protect their own people first, the response to this pandemic has to be collective. Yet his pleas fell on deaf ears. To illustrate to what extent Tedros was ignored, by the 18th of January, remember last Christmas coming out of it, 39 million doses had been given in high-income countries, while only 25 
that's 25 in total, were provided in low-income countries. Several months later, we can remember we went into spring, the U.S. had administered doses to almost half their populations, in the U.K. more than half. In contrast, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan, it was about 0.5% of their population, with the highest vaccination rate in Africa at the time being 3% in South Africa. Additional problems arose when India, which was the main supplier for vaccines for the world, had their second wave last spring, resulting in the government banning vaccine exports in order to keep vaccines for their own population. So was this situation unexpected? I would say not at all. Rich countries have always looked out for their own interests, and it would be difficult to see any national leader telling their citizens that after a year of restrictions and suffering with vaccines as the main tool to lift lockdowns, that doses would be going abroad. Rich countries are usually happy to help the world after they have taken what they need. And to be fair, there is an argument for putting the fire in your own house out before trying to help others. But Tedros continued to call it this moral failing. He says, vaccine nationalism, where a handful of nations have taken the lion's share, is morally indefensible and an ineffective public health strategy against a respiratory virus that is mutating quickly. At the stage in the pandemic, the fact that millions of health and social care workers have still not been vaccinated is abhorrent. And there were people speaking out. Think of Dr. Jeremy Farrar of the Wellcome Trust and, and myself. And we were trying to say vaccinating the world is also an issue of self-interest because letting the virus spread uncontrolled would lead to variants and to leading to mutations. And this could undermine the gains made in rich countries. Rich countries would only be safe when everyone was safe in the world. And yes, new variants did arrive in 2021. And this challenged even the most advanced rollout in Israel and the UK. And I remember the moment of seeing Israel doing so well, getting almost to zero deaths, zero cases, and then Delta being seeded and it taking off again. And Delta was really like almost a whole new virus for the world. And so the response was, we need boosters. And the UK, Israel, Germany, the United States started planning boosters. And this was happening when many low-income countries had not even started vaccinating healthcare workers and the most vulnerable. And again, WHO tried to call this out. Mike Ryan, the head of the WHO's emergency program, said, there are people who want to have their cake and eat it, and they want to have more cake and eat that too. But on the other hand, you can see it from the side of politicians here. Governments were under pressure to do everything they could to vaccinate their populations and stay out of restrictions. In democracies across the world, leaders who failed in this task would be punished at the ballot box. So how do you square looking after your nearest friends, neighbors, and family members with helping people half a world away? And this has been a real challenge through the COVID-19 crisis, given it has affected all parts of the world. So returning to the competitive world of vaccine nationalism, how did this look for those sitting in Africa? So John Nkengasan, the first director of the African CDC, warned Western countries that this is going to trigger social unrest and a backlash, saying it would be extremely terrible if the world watches Africa not receiving vaccines and sees the global north getting more and boosters. He tried early on to secure bulk orders for vaccines for African governments, trying to pool their collective power to, to get some, but they couldn't compete against richer countries. And in an interview, he said, we have to look at this crisis in our best faces and ask, what kind of future do we want for the continent? We import 99% of our vaccines and only manufacture 1%. And if we continue to rely on that dynamic, I would characterize that as unacceptable. We have to have research hubs in Africa and manufacturing to take care of our own. And therefore, right now, I do remain skeptical of any talk about better agreements or resolutions or deals to make sharing more fair. Because vaccine nationalism is not a new phenomenon. The same was true in the 2009 swine flu pandemic. And before then, with smallpox and polio vaccines, too. To expect rich countries to share at their own expense is to repeat a cycle of good words, paper agreements, and then disappointment and a lack of real action. I think the real lesson here is boosting regional manufacturing capacity and self-sufficiency of different parts of the world. The third breakdown of international cooperation has been in investigating, here we go, where did COVID-19 come from? And I think that's probably all of us at some point have puzzled about this and have our own theories. And for me, understanding the origin is less about blame and more about how do we prevent future pandemics by learning how this was introduced to humans and how it could have been avoided. So initially, as I showed you in that memo, the outbreak was linked to a wet market where live animals were kept in cage conditions with the premise that several individuals might have been infected by the same animal there. And again, there's a paper out today looking at that theory. Wet markets are a risk given poor ventilation, poor drainage, and really the close proximity of animals in unhygienic conditions with thousands of daily visitors. 
And evidence shows that a transmission cl cluster developed in the market because genomic sequencing was almost identical among all the cases in the market. And genomic sequencing has become one of our most powerful tools to track pandemics because it's almost like a fingerprint. Each time the virus replicates inside a new host, mutations arise, and these can be tracked in real time. And then we can understand over time how things have spread and where they came from. And this has been crucial, whether it was in creating the first test kits in mid-January 2020, to designing the vaccines, to tracking the spread of variants now in 2021. So returning to Wuhan in December 2019, the Chinese government immediately shut the market for further investigation. Although the wildlife produce were considered potential hosts, none of the animals tested positive. In addition, it became clear that other COVID cases were emerging that had absolutely no link to the, to the first diagnosed man at the market. And then the idea became this was more of a super spreading event rather than the first introduction into humans. And the Chinese government, to be fair, has been difficult and cagey in sharing information on the earliest cluster of cases, which some suspect was in November 2019, or when exactly high-level officials were aware they were facing a novel pathogen of possible pandemic potential. And while it did notify the WHO on the 30th of the December, under their obligations, under international law, they have not made it easy for any external group to come into the country and assess the origins. In fact, the Chinese government has put forward their own theory called the cold chain hypothesis that the virus originated outside of China, potentially in Italy, and was brought into the country in late 2019, and that RNA contaminants could have been frozen in food in some place, it was imported, and therefore China is not to blame for the pandemic because the virus was imported from another part of the world. But part of the problem has been the caginess of the government to letting an international team in has led to outlandish conspiracy theories, and you heard some of them from President Donald, former President Donald Trump, but also somewhat reasonable allegations that it could have been held in a lab and then accidentally leaked out into the community. Former US President Donald Trump often said he, that he believed this was the case and that China knows more than they're sharing. And he pointed to the high security biosecurity level four lab in Wuhan, a key research hub for coronaviruses, and suggested that experiments within the lab created the virus, which then escaped into the local community. The benign intent might have been to create a vaccine. So they were holding samples to try to create a vaccine against. So how do we move from these various theories to actually figuring out what is true? Well, it requires investigation and data. So finally, at the beginning of 2021, after months of negotiation with the Chinese government, which had resisted an independent mission, the WHO got permission to let an international team spend four weeks in China. But from the start, the team was constrained. Team members expressed concern of whether they could really identify the origins in just a few weeks after a whole year had passed. The team spent two weeks with online discussions with Chinese scientists, epi epidemiologists, and doctors. They had long working days. They met and questioned people such as Wuhan doctors, the relatives of deceased healthcare workers, the first COVID case, which was they think was on officially the 8th of December. And all of this was organized and chaperoned by the Chinese government. With the final report noting that the virus had probably been transmitted from bats to humans through another animal through a natural explanation, and that a lab leak was extremely unlikely. That might have been the end of story, except the US government under the Biden administration was unhappy with this. They said the investigation was not fully independent and revealed deep tension and trust between the US and the Chinese governments. So in March 2021, Tedros came out, the Director General of WHO, and said that data was withheld from the team, particularly raw data, there was no lab audit, audit done, and noted, I do not believe that this assessment was extensive enough to rule out the lab leak theory. The Chinese government reacted badly, and poor WHO went from being seen as, you know, as I said at the start, as being bending to the Chinese, as being seen as bending to the Americans, with the Chinese government allegedly threatening to run a candidate against him if he didn't drop this investigate, line of investigation and accuse the WHO of being in the pocket of the US government. The situation has still not been resolved. We don't fully understand the origins. Every day new information is coming out, and some say we may never know actually where it came from given how much time has passed. But I think what we have not yet found, which I think we're all waiting for, is an animal host. In MERS, we found camels. In SARS, we found some cats. The question is what will be here. So I'm going to start now moving into conclusions and start wrapping up and offering where we go from here. So looking forward. So first, we now face a world where cooperation is increasingly needed to manage interconnected health threats. I've just talked about how we're probably going to have more and more of these. But the rise of populism and nationalism makes this increasingly unlikely. At the global level, this disease has almost resulted in a perverse Hunger Games, where countries compete in the league tables of who has more deaths, while also trying not to sink their economies and societies while coping with wave after wave of this disease. 
Just think back to February and March 2020, when all governments chased down limited PPE stocks, reagents, ventilators, oxygen, and experimental steroid and drugs. The US government was accused of stealing ventilators destined for Barbados and PPE destined for Germany. It then bought up all the rights to the drug Remdesivir, limiting stocks to other countries. And despite a World Health Assembly resolution in May 2020, all countries got together, including a reticent United States with a Trump appointee, they committed to sharing research product, pro products and working collectively to address COVID-19. This cooperation broke down when tough decisions had to be made over the allocation of resources. And as COVID has continued, has only accentuated this breakdown further as countries have taken care of their self-interests first. And in my view, if anything, will increasingly move manufacturing and supply chains within their own borders and within their control, not wanting to rely on other parts of the world. And in parallel to this, a frustration from low-income countries with limited supplies of vaccine and the wish to be self-sufficient in future crisis and not reliant on charity of the West. My second takeaway is that the trust in and normative leadership of the traditional rich donor countries has been dramatically eroded. The perceived flawed responses in the US and UK invariably begs the question of whether these countries and our experts will have the same moral and normative leadership in the future. And also because the rest of the world feels that the rich countries took care of themselves and left the rest of the world to sink. I don't have enough time to go into it, but it is interesting to note that China and Russia stepped into this vacuum through geopolitical vaccine diplomacy, offering their vaccines in return for certain political favors. Finally, one of the most frequent questions I get is, will there be another pandemic? Of course there will. The world will face a similar challenge to SARS-CoV-2. And while we cannot prevent these viruses circulating in animals, it's just, there's too many, we can change how we respond and learn from past mistakes. And I think four clear, less clear lessons emerge. First, the biggest public health risks that we face are animal viruses jumping to humans. Every time a virus circulates among animals and comes into contact with a human, there is a chance that one of these viruses will infect us and lead to human-to-human -human transmission. And if it's respiratory, it's pretty impossible to stop wherever it emerges in this world. And this is why we need further global cooperation and surveillance to identify disease risks, almost like a weather service to scan for new pathogens of concern, identify spillover risks, where you might have hot spots and mitigate them. And right now, that's not only true for new pathogens, but also new variants. Normally, we know about a new variant because it arrives on our shores, not because it's circulating somewhere else in the world. And so there's a real need for sequencing, genetic sequencing in place to detect new strains, new viruses, track their spread across the world. And that is something we can build up now to help us with COVID-19, but is really important going into the future. Second, we must invest in the resources necessary to move towards 100 days. And this is actually, I think, a really optimistic thing that's come out of this. The three scientific tools through a pandemic are testing, vaccines, and therapeutics. And while the COVID-19 vaccine development has been astonishing, remarkable, a large part here due to the research at Oxford, we need to be even faster next time to avoid the death, disease, and restrictions. And 100 days is a new target. In the past, it was five years. That's come down to 365 days. Now it's 100 days. But developing the vaccine was only half the battle as we've learned. We now need to be thinking about manufacturing capacity in country and having regional hubs to mass produce quite quickly. African countries are tired, of talked about, as I've talked about, on relying on the goodwill of rich countries. Not even a pandemic treaty, as being discussed at the G7 and G20, can overcome issues of sovereignty and state self-interest. Instead, the challenge is to create regional hubs with enough supply so that it's about mass market production everywhere at the same time. The third lesson is given that we know a pandemic influenza is on the horizon, how do we already invest in a universal influenza vaccine? That is a vaccine, instead of every year, our seasonal influenza program tries to based on expert prediction, predictions guess that is the strain that's gonna be circulating. What if we could actually move towards one dose universal vaccine that provides immunity over several years and against various influenza strains? That means we would already be ready to go. And there are those kind of vaccines being trialed and being studied. Just this year, the first human clinical trial of a universal flu vaccine was completed, and it uses recombinant genetic technology. So basically, it mixes different pieces of different flu viruses almost into a patchwork so your body responds to different parts. It's been successful. This could also be true of a pan-coronavirus vaccine, given the risks that MERS and SARS pose. And finally, it's a real question whether we do need to examine our flu pandemic playbook on how we respond to an incoming acute respiratory pathogen. These pathogens were seen as unstoppable. But in the process of managing COVID, we unintentionally eliminated seasonal flu and many other respiratory infections.
For governments, the question I think now is to relook and say, should we ever move into mitigation and accepting the spread of a disease rather than containment until we have a scientific breakthrough? How many could have survived COVID-19 had we found a way to buy time and delay infections until the era of vaccines and therapeutics that we live in now? As we reflect on the past almost two years, the words at least that come to my mind are never again. Never again should millions of lives be lost to a new virus, a number that would have been unthinkable before COVID. When we thought infectious diseases that wiped out these kind of numbers were a thing of the past. Never again should children be taken out of school, unable to learn in classrooms or socialize with their peers. And if you look at countries like Malawi, forced into marriages, employment and caring roles, which means they may never return to school again. Never again should unemployment rates soar as small businesses shut and larger ones made sweeping redundancies. Never again should over 100,000 health workers die, many of whom lacked personal protective equipment, clothing, and vaccines. Never again should we endure months and months of lockdowns, deaths, and the pain that our world has experienced. For humanity, the challenge now is how do we heal these open wounds that COVID has exposed? Wealth was indeed the best shielding strategy, not only from COVID-19, but from the response to it. Lockdowns exposed the plight of the poor and overcrowded housing compared to the country's states of the rich. And as countries now look towards rebuilding and healing, they must also think longer term and quite honestly about the mistakes made, the gaps exploited by the virus, and how best to prepare and respond now. We have already seen through this crisis that countries that learn from their previous experiences, think of Taiwan with SARS, South Korea with MERS, Senegal with Ebola, they did better with COVID-19 because they knew it was coming. So now the question is, will countries learn from their mistakes and rebuild society in a way that is more resilient and more equal? Will governments cooperate to think of how to do things better or will they turn inwards and become more selfish? How do we use this crisis to build a better world? That is the challenge, in my view, a political challenge for leaders who need to bring their people together when right now we have uncertainty and division that has been exposed through the COVID crisis. I'm optimistic myself that we can and we will do better and I think right now, the next time this comes around, I do not think we would repeat many of the mistakes that have been made. So I will end there and say I've put all this into my book, which is out in 2022, 20, um, which goes through country by country responses and it's kind of a longer version of this lecture. Thank you very much. I'll end there. Clarity, and if I may say so, intense rigor on that presentation. It's a delight, and I'm sure tutors um, and colleagues uh, will agree with me. It's a delight to hear somebody from Pembroke on the world stage. Um, and so we are enormously grateful for her contributions okay, thank you. Thank you. to the debate tonight. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have a number of questions um, already. Um, may I <clears throat> start off with something that you hinted at um, during the course of the lecture, and then it became clearer and clearer as we went through the history. And that is, um, if we'd all listened to WHO advice, um, we might have done it better. Was the advice as good as uh, it should have been at the earliest stages? I think. There was a lot of information by the end of January and definitely by mid-February. So we already knew in January the hospitalization rate of patients. We already understood um, the clinical profile of who was affected, the age gradient and the comorbidities. So again, you could just take the demography of the UK or the US and understand how many people that would be affected. The two, you could say, surprises of COVID in February were asymptomatic spread, which some call the Achilles heel which is really difficult to stop a virus if people feel healthy and can circulate. It's much easier if they're ill in hospital because you can trace their contacts. 
And the second part was the airborne dimension. That I don't know if you've heard of all, if you've been following this, is it airborne, is it not airborne, is it droplets? And I think we obsess too much about that rather than actually what do you do about it, which is what all of you are doing, which is wearing masks and getting on with that. If you think back to how late we were to implement masks in Western countries when already many countries started doing it, and if you look at countries like the Czech Republic without having the evidence base, they just told everyone to wear masks. The city of Jena in Germany did it, and they actually managed to control their infection rates. Look, even now at South Korea and Japan, they've largely stayed open, but using that intervention. The, the, the real, I think, place where you lot, got a lot of information was the Diamond Princess cruise ship. I don't know if you guys remember this cruise ship, and they didn't, the WHO didn't know what to tell the Japanese government. The Japanese government had a cruise ship full of people from around the world, and they were, the infection was spreading. And they didn't want to take anyone off the ship, because they didn't know what's going to happen if you send them home. They didn't want to keep them on the ship, because they're infecting each other. Um, and from that, we did learn about asymptomatic carriers, because they tested everyone. I think about 40 to 50% came out being asymptomatic carriers. Quite a lot of those people on the ship died, because also elderly 70, 80 year olds who were on the ship. So there was a lot of information by the end of February. And so I think when I look back and people say, oh, we didn't have this information, I said, if you're paying attention, and the governments that were, I mean, South Korea to me, if I look at a country that's done really well, has done remarkably well at, at keeping, of course, with, you could say, different surveillance techniques that we, what we might consider acceptable here. And so I think that's been the really interesting thing to see how different governments responded. Yeah. Is that a key? I mean, if you're looking something South Korea did that we didn't do, um, is the the difference uh, in the culture and therefore the surveillance permissibility um, of, of some importance? No, I think it was in the leadership, if I'm really honest. Uh, I mean, I think, so South Korea had, you could say, the benefit, I don't call it a benefit, because it's a tragedy, of a MERS outbreak a few years earlier. MERS kills a third of people who get it, and quite a lot of young people, right? And so they had experienced this in their hospitals, and I think about 100 people became infected and a third of them died. And the public were angry, because there wasn't testing for them to identify it was MERS, so it could spread. And so based on this, they did pass legislation, but also real readiness. And so, of course, when they heard the murmurs of a new coronavirus, MERS is a coronavirus out of China, their mind went to MERS. They're like, oh my goodness, can you imagine? And I think, you know, Taiwan's mind went to SARS, because they had been horrifically hit by that. West Africa's response went to Ebola, and they built off their Ebola structures. Where I think in the West, we went to flu, because that's what kills a lot of people here in the winter. We don't experience big outbreaks of measles, or we didn't get hit by SARS or MERS. And so I think it was more that, and also clear trust in the government. I mean, look at their vaccination uptake now. They vaccinated almost 78% of their total population, we're at about 67% of our total population, meaning kids as well. And they're on track to get to 90%, I think in, what were they saying, a few weeks? Yes. That's trust, right? And so um, I think here we spent a lot of time debating what to do, where I think the challenge wasn't what to do, it was how to do it best. The lawyers amongst us might join with some politicians in saying trust, respect, and confidence is key to leadership. <laughs> um, if I'm being bold, can I say, did we have enough of that in this country? <laughs> or would I, should I leave that, <laughs> leave that to the audience to determine? So I get in a lot of trouble for saying things because I'm in an advisory role and I make it repeated. <laughs> I think we could say that I think people would say in, in government, I mean, just read Jeremy Hunt's commission report that he did. You know, the Committee on Health and Social Care did a report, um, the one that Jeremy and leads, I testified to that committee. And they go through, I mean, mistakes were made. I think everyone can accept that we were late on testing, we were late on PPE to healthcare workers, we were late on border measures, we went into a harsh first lockdown. I mean, I think what was really hard to witness from Scotland is we went into a really harsh lockdown. I mean, we really put people in their homes mm -hmm. at great cost. I mean, think of children, that's where my mind went, think of children who are going home to abusive parents and they're not gonna see an adult for they don't know how long. They can't see a neighbor, they can't see a teacher, they can't see a football coach. I mean, it was pretty horrific, the kind of lockdowns we had for certain types of kids and families, or women as well, who were perhaps in domestic abuse situations. Um, and in Scotland, we had that, and sequencing shows that we eliminated the first strains of the virus in summer 2020. We had like four cases. And so at that point, my mind went to, well, we know we're gonna get a resurgence in the winter. We know vaccines are coming, though it's gonna take six months. We need to wait for vaccines and kind of seal off to prevent, but of course, if you have, and this has come back to the geography, if you're in New Zealand, and an Irish from New Zealand, if you're from Australia, it's easier, right? Because you can say we seal off, we put people in hotel quarantine, it comes at great cost to tourism, but you can do it. 
You can't do it if you're, I think, having a Heathrow and you're having land borders across. Yes. So I think that's some of the, some of the difficulty um, more practically. But I think all of us would say, I mean, recently, I do want to call it out. I mean, having um, the prime minister in a hospital without a mask walking around right now, the message it gives to people is that the pandemic is over. We're still having 250 people die every day. Um, hospitals are full, healthcare workers are burned out. You only need to talk to people working in the NHS. That is, it is a difficult winter. Um, and I think modeling by leaders of saying, I'm going to wear the mask, I'm going to you know, say this is a serious virus. I think the mistake we also made, and then I'll, and then I'll move on, is that we've debated, is COVID-19 serious? And for me, that was never the question. Of course it's serious, it's how do we manage it? And it's how do we make it a manageable problem? How do we use vaccines? And again, having been criticized and trolled and hit by anti-lockdowners because I guess of my more vocal public role, the point I always try to make to them is all about that healthcare capacity line and the epi curves. If we're going over the line and healthcare collapses, your excess mortality goes up and people die. And so if you want to stay out of a lockdown, how do you push that curve down? Vaccines, they push that curve down. Less people go to hospital. Therapeutics push that curve down. Building more hospitals if you have the staff makes the top line go up. But just saying you're anti-lockdown doesn't solve the problem. To me, it was like, Great, we're all anti-lockdown. I don't like lockdowns either, but there's a problem every country has faced. Yep. How are you going to solve it? Now, can I open up to the audience? There are a number of hands that wanted to go up, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to start with Irene because uh, I think she deserves a first <laughs> shot. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, David. That, that was absolutely terrific. Um, is this on? Can people hear all right? Yep, great. Um, I was really struck, and many probably similarly so, about the, just the number of things the WHO are having to triage in terms of outbreaks around the world. I mean, those numbers were staggering, um, and clearly they do a terrific job. But if I understood you right, you were quite defeatist about the capability going forwards of really containing that just because of the speed at which things spread now around the world due to flights. So my question is, how, how well does it work, that triaging, and what, what might be, in a more optimistic take on that, better ways that we could in more point of care sort of management using social media, actually have a more effective local lockdown so that you really you nip it in the bud? Or is or shall we just accept that it, it that's impossible now and, and there's just going to be a lot more spread? So we have to do the sort of one, two, three measures as you were referring. Yeah, I think that comes down to transmission mechanism of how the virus spreads. So if you have something that spreads like Ebola through um, bodily fluids, it's easier to stop because you can easier you know, isolate cases, and it has been stopped. Look at the, you know, Congo has done it in really remote areas. If you have something that's airborne and respiratory, it's pretty hard to stop. So obviously your gold standard is elimination, eradication, we did with SARS and MERS, and I think China did attempt that, right? They did get to zero cases. But I think the only way this could have been stopped is probably in November or December when they detected their first cases that they shut their all flights, they grounded everything, and I can't see any government doing that. I mean, even now, I am slightly sympathetic to the UK government because, yeah, in February, if they had said, okay, we're gonna shut Heathrow, can you imagine? In February, with no cases, but to be fair, Mali did that. You know, the country saw this. I remember in January, Tedros did a briefing for African ministers, and he presented those numbers, 20% of patients end up in hospital. It's been down, downwardly revised now with asymptomatics to about 10 to 12%, and a third of them end up in ICU. Some of these countries have one ventilator, like in the whole country. They knew they couldn't have any spread because where I think here there's idea, oh, we can maybe make it, we can maybe, we can maybe do it. Um, so it's a really difficult one. So yes, I think right now the two kind of projects I've seen going on is one about how do we detect and respond quicker. So we try to stop if we can and make it a localized event. And it is quite effective. I mean, you probably haven't heard about Nipah virus in Kerala because they managed to contain it there. But with a fast moving respiratory pathogen, I think you need to move quickly to getting scientific solutions because elimination, eradication, it might work. As I said, if you're an island, you can hold. I think it's a great holding strategy while you wait. But in the end, um, even now with New Zealand, they're going to have to open up. It's better if they can open up vaccinating and with therapeutics because many people will survive that wouldn't have survived had they not taken that approach. Um, and they have to judge if the economic toll is worth it of, of having done that. Um, but I think right now the idea is we need to get scientific is the only exit, the scientific route of a therapeutic or a vaccine or some kind of breakthrough. Thank you. Gentleman in the middle. There's two, one after the other, if I may. 
Thank you. You mentioned that Austria has gone into total lockdown uh, today. There's also a report out of Austria uh, that they are going to make uh, vaccination mandatory in uh, all adults and children over the age of 15. Is that something you envisage happening in other countries? And could you envisage that happening in this country? Um, who knows? I mean, if you had, I remember going on Newsnight in February and they asked me a similar question. Do you think we'll see school closures in March in lockdown? And I said, well, it's happened in other places. And they said, no chance it'll ever happen here. And I said, okay. But so I, 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 right now I would say no, but I think what we are likely to be heading towards is probably what we call vaccine certification for indoor settings. But there is a lot of pushback to that, which is the idea that if you want to go into indoor settings, which are more risky, you need to show you're fully vaccinated or have a negative test. So I see this as being more likely rather than saying that everyone has to be vaccinated. I mean, Britain doesn't really have, I think, a history of mandatory jabs for school kids the way the United States has had. California, if you want to go to school, you had to have your MMR vaccine. That is not the case here. But I think the real challenge for governments is how to keep their hospitals from collapsing because that leads to social unrest. It leads to what we see it in Jordan. I mean, people like lighting fires outside hospitals because their relatives are dying because they don't have oxygen and healthcare staff being attacked because they're like, this is what hospital collapse means. It's social unrest. It's, it's the collapse of the state in a way. And that is what they're trying to avoid. Um, and so they're trying to use vaccination and therapeutics and other tools to try to get, keep their economies open because they also know going into a full-scale lockdown has major economic costs. Um, and, and so it's, it's, I, I'm not envious of any politician right now. And even looking at places like, you know, I praise South Korea a lot. I think New Zealand's done an admirable job. They're going to find a tough time too. South Korea's opened up. They're trying to live with it and they're going to face a wave. Their wave is 3,000 cases. Our wave is 100,000 cases. So there's some difference in what's considered a wave. But there's no easy out. The only out is vaccinating. And vaccinations, unfortunately, are not a silver bullet. People still die who are doubly vaccinated, who are elderly. And to ask people to live what I would consider as unsocially, not seeing others, is also a death sentence for some people. Loneliness, dementia, um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I saw it I'll end here with my grandparents because they're in India, they're almost 90, and they're very social. They go into the office, they had friends, like many elderly people, have very active social lives. And their choices were they would go out, keep circulating, get COVID and likely die of it or stay at home and see anyone and face mental, what I would call mental imprisonment, because you basically lose any sense of days and reality and mental deterioration. And that's just a bad situation. Um, I don't know why I've got to hear from your question on, on, on are we gonna have vaccinations, but just to show it's, it's really difficult and I don't wanna underplay how complex the situation is. And any measures that governments are taking, I don't think they're taking lightly. I don't think the Austrian government took that measure lightly. It's because their cases, I don't know if you've looked, they are spiking and they are in trouble and they are basically doctor, hospitals are saying we can't offload ambulances and people are dying in ambulances. And that's the point that people get. It's very hard because here in Britain, you know, you debate, I remember I did a debate and someone said, but who needs medical care? And I'm like, we all think that way until your mother has a heart attack or until your child is dying because they can't get oxygen because they have asthma. And then you want a doctor then and there. And that's a difficulty. It's, it's kind of explaining that to people of why you need medical care, which I think was self-evident, but apparently isn't to some parts of society. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Schiller, uh, I've, you know, one of the things that you said, uh, uh, I'm a visiting fellow and I was actually, I, I remember traveling in February 2020 from uh, uh, Khartoum to JFK. And in Khartoum, they uh, gave, you know, life boy soaps to wash your hands because of COVID. And then in, you land in JFK and there was absolutely nothing. So the, you know, is it is it a fact that uh, there are countries, you know, based on you know the donate the contributions to the WHO, for instance, whether they they want to listen or not? I mean, how much advice they take from the WHO, you know, varies between from government to government. So do you think this has been a factor, you know, and and what can be done, you know, to remedy this, you know, in the U.S. or you know with the CDC or with the NHS? I mean, do they even really want to you know listen to the WHO, you know, when uh, you come out with some kind of a, you know a global policy? Uh, and secondly, what do we do about the morale of, uh, you know, healthcare workers? This has been, you know, I mean, a war, you know, and, and no less. And yet, uh, beyond the psychological dimension, in just in terms of keeping up their morale, do you feel governments have done enough and, and what can be done, you know, for the next pandemic? Uh, 
Great questions. So on the first, yeah, I think traditionally WHO was seen as serving low and middle income countries. It was seen as, and, and those countries do rely on their technical expertise on the country offices and work quite closely with ministries of health. Um, the World Bank, I haven't mentioned, but also working closely with ministries of finance on how they're actually gonna support their health sectors. So I do think that you know, the UK, the US, European countries all kind of did what they thought best in quite a bubble. And we're very slow to learn from China and South Korea. We can talk about Delta, the new variant. I think it's quite hard to control, um, as we're seeing, because other countries, I mean, I think New Zealand gave up elimination because they said Delta is too infectious. China is struggling even. But the original wild type, China managed to control it. And then Taiwan did. And then South Korea did. So instead of quickly looking and saying, what are they doing? And how many of those measures can we do here? Obviously, we couldn't do everything China was doing because some of it was pretty intensive and um, could infringe on human rights. We wouldn't want to have that here, but you could learn other things. And countries like Denmark, I would say Norway, um, Finland, look closely and closer to home. They were looking and they were learning and building up their testing and their, and their capability. We were very, very slow to listen and learn, I think, because we're not used to looking at other parts of the world and, and learning. We're used to telling. Um, what them to do. And to be fair, I'm guilty of that too. I mean, you know, global health experts, we fly to Malawi for two weeks, then we think we know Malawi and we're going to tell everyone there how to run their country, right? So there is a problem there, an inherent kind of bias and thinking we know best. On your second one on healthcare workers, I can tell you what not to do, which has been the recent savage campaign by certain media outlets um, on GPs, on healthcare staff, saying that they're lazy, that they're not working enough hours that they're not doing face-to-face. -face. Um, it's really hit morale really hard because most people who go into medicine, I'm guessing there are quite a few here, do it because they want to help people. They do it because actually they feel a strong sense of public service. And to go from being clapped for, remember every, so every Thursday you go clap for, for healthcare workers, to then being told, you know, you're the bad guys. Think of, I mean, I could, pull, I could put up pages from the front of the, of the you know, um, Daily Mail, for example, blaming GPs, blaming doctors, why are they being, it's like saying, well, the problem we don't have food deliveries is the problem of the truck drivers. You're like, no, it's because there's not enough truck drivers, <laughs> right? It's not their fault. And I think that's one thing is to make them feel appreciated and to say the problem really is we don't have enough. Staffing is an issue and we don't have enough staffing because people are leaving because they're burnt out and they realize they could do other stuff and be happier and have better life balance. And they put themselves at risk. I mean, I think people didn't understand that people who went onto the wards in March, 2020 didn't have adequate PPE. They went on and exposed themselves. And I saw this because I teach medical students in Edinburgh and they put often junior doctors on the wards because they were younger. And so they were writing to me and they're just like, we're just being sent out. They weren't offered testing. So if they were ill or exposed, there was no testing. Um, where if you were Tom Hanks or Heidi Klum, you got testing, right? It was a luxury good for, for the wealthy. So testing was there, but you just had to be in the right, instead of going to the people on the COVID wards, um, and now, and it's a global phenomenon, so Canada, the United States, you know, Australia, I've heard here, doctors being spit at, being attacked in hospital, you know, anti-vaxxers coming in. It's very difficult. I mean, I'm going to pivot to my topic, but I actually think misinformation, disinformation, Facebook has created a huge, huge problem because people cannot differentiate what is true and what is false. And as I said, I always thought that if a MERS kind of thing would emerge where 30% of people are being killed, governments would say, okay, stay in your homes, we're going to resolve this, and people would do it. And now I'm like, maybe someone on Facebook says it's a hoax. And then 50,000 people go onto the streets and a third of them end up in hospital. I mean, that's the world we're in. And I think the disinformation or misinformation around anti-vax, around the COVID is a hoax, around these kind of new influencers is very, very scary in terms of governments not having any control over the response. And then when they try to control it, then being told, oh, you're being a ministry of truth. You're trying to have the soul toward the you know, sole source of truth when they're saying, well, no, we're trying to help you differentiate what's true and what's not true because it's very difficult now with the, with, with the internet. Can I come to Stephen and then the gentleman with the microphone at the back? Stephen first. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry, can you hear? Is it on? Yes, it is on. Thank you, Devi. Um, you, uh, you touched a little bit in your last response to something I'm interested in. It's just about, as it were, COVID and the response and contemporary politics. If you can say a little bit about that. You mentioned the populism word in your talk, but how much of this is, as it were, if we were to imagine a world in which there was not a huge populist movement or authoritarian governments competing, um, 
how much of the response and the number of deaths, etc., can we lay at the door of the political situation and the kind of competition in, in politics that we're currently facing? Yeah, it's really difficult because politicians want to be popular and they want to tell people things that make them feel good. And so I think if you talk to, again, most scientists sitting on the advisor groups that I've been sitting on, everyone knew this was a chronic issue from the start and we would have recurrent lockdowns. It was modeled. And that's what business leaders wanted to hear. They wanted to know, how do I plan my business, right, for the next five years or three years? And instead, what we heard from populist leaders is the virus is going to miraculously disappear. I think Trump said that. Um, drink bleach, you'll be fine. Um, that was also said. Or even here, the virus is going to be gone by Christmas, right? It's going to, it's going to, you're going to have a normal Christmas because that's what people wanted to hear, and that's what give you a bump in the polls because they want to be popular. And I think it's very difficult because I feel like I'm on the opposite side. I became so unpopular because you were asked questions like, is it safe to meet for Christmas? And this was a time when we had very high rates. Remember last December, we had a new variant, Alpha, circulating. We didn't yet have vaccines out. And of course, you kind of want to say, like, no. <laughs> You're kind of ducking at the same time. No political leader wants to say that. So I have a lot of respect for leaders who came out and were willing to be straightforward. And I think what people actually, funny enough, did find hard was not understanding the full scale of the crisis. In some way, I don't know, it would be better for people to know this is going to last a couple of years. This is going to be the phases. This is what we're working towards. I know businesses preferred that, clearly, because they have to plan. Or do they prefer these snippets of like, it's gone in six months, normal Christmas, go back to work, don't go back to work, eat out to help out. But if you eat inside, it's really, ri I mean, I didn't understand the eat out to help out scheme. They should have had takeaway schemes, right? Like, eat, or eat outside, al fresco, you know? It's, it was a bit um, difficult. So it's a really hard one, but I think it comes down to the qualities of leaders and gaining respect. And I mean, I don't want to go into any kind of political um, comments, but I will say having sat in Scotland and seen Nicola Sturgeon, she did come out and was really tough and saying things like, we might face another lockdown and it is gonna be difficult and very, very serious about the situation, which made her unpopular at the start, but I think her popularity ra rose over time when people said we'd rather just know the truth rather than having a spin version of it. Gentleman with the microphone at the back and then uh, David our junior proctor at the front. Thank you, David. That was a brilliant, brilliant lecture uh, <laughs> as always. Um, can I, I just maybe an unfair question, um, but, um, but it's, a, it's a connection people have made. I mean, could, could, could I ask you to compare the pandemic to the climate crisis? Because you've got the same problems of, collect, same collective, active, act, collective action problems internationally. You've got the same feeling that we're all in this together, but at the same time, it's exposing huge inequalities um, and, and so on. And of course, there's one extra kick, which is of course the developed world is actually responsible for most of the warming. So, uh, and, and as I say, some, some people say that it's actually one problem, the pandemic and the global warming. Yeah, so I, that's my PhD supervisor asking me a really difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually think there are huge parallels actually with what I think is probably the next looming health threat, um, which Nari and I have worked on, which is antimicrobial resistance, like AMR, like basically bacterial that's resistant to our first line antibiotics, because we're focused very much here on regulating it in the UK, like we are regulating hopefully our admissions, but probably the biggest emitters in AMR are Brazil, India, China, which um, are using a lot of antibiotics in their animal, um, how they raise animals, and it's very unregulated. So you can walk into pharmacies and buy lots of different things, which creates a problem for us because of the externality that someone could become resistant to something, a bacteria develops and then get on a plane and come here and then spreads. So I think there's a huge problem around global cooperation in, ter in, 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 in this area because the risks and benefits are not, as in climate, are not equally balanced. Um, and it's a really hard one, I think it comes down to this fractious relationship between the US and Chinese governments, which has carried over from Trump into the Biden administration, which is still having difficulty. We saw them try to reach a resolution in, in COP26, um, which again, was, it was an amazing to see that in the middle of a pandemic and soaring rates, we had this huge conference of like thousands of people coming through, um, which resulted in Glasgow having the lowest rates in the whole country, which is also puzzling. Um, and shows actually that mitigations, they were really strict on vaccinations and testing, mean you can do a lot 
because they were so strict, they were so worried about the impact of it, they kind of over, overreacted, but actually reacted well because we haven't seen a big spike because of that. Um, but I don't know how we solve this right now. I think if anything, countries are turning more inwards. And as part of the prep for the Fulbright, um, the Fulbright Commission worked with King's um, College and with Ipsos Mori to do a survey, which is the reports out today. And it looked at that issue of where do you think cooperation should be between countries, but it also showed that countries are looking more inwards now after this. People are more concerned about what's happening domestically. So if you're interested, the survey's out on the website today, um, and you can have a look. They surveyed the public in the UK, in the US, and Canada, and looked over the past few years till today, their attitudes towards global cooperation, and also their attitudes towards how they think the world perceives of their domestic COVID response, and quite interesting results that people are I don't know if you'd expect that. People are becoming more inwards looking. Countries are becoming more inwards looking. Last question, please, David. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> there's something you said about the uh, COVAX debates, which um, uh, just set my uh, mind running. So, so three questions, really, that turn around the uh, axes of uh, supply, demand, and access. So uh, you said that perhaps regional centers and production in Africa or South Asia um, might reduce the, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, um, our, our, um, reduce, sorry, um, our dependence, um, you know, on, 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 um, on Western countries. Uh, so the first question really on, um, on supply um, is, um, is really in a sense, what integrity might there be, and I think particularly of South Africa here, where contracts for um, you know production of, of of various things sometimes go awry. The second question is really around demand, and we know from history and culture that there hasn't been a great deal of demand. The anti-vax debate in Africa has been as alive as it is here. And thirdly, really, the question of access and inequalities. And we know that there are sharper uh, questions around access within countries more than between them. So how do we account for rurality or various other strains of poverty within countries uh, like Nigeria, South Africa, Malawi, uh, rather than between the countries? Great questions, and, and I'll try to answer them, but it's a tricky one. I mean, I think right now the main constraint, if we think of COVID-19, is supply. It's actually not in other in poor countries' anti-vax sentiment yet, because they haven't even reached that level. You can see we get sticky beyond a certain level. So you vaccinate yourself, and you guys start getting sticky because you see people who, I wouldn't call them anti-vaxxers, they're vaccine hesitant or don't want to be bothered or they don't see it as a priority. And so that's why I guess I focused on supply because I think the problem has been doses and getting them out in the volume that we need. And when India went into its wave and couldn't export, you saw the hit to so many countries who were relying on those factories. And the main problem, as I think you've highlighted, is that um, the factories aren't built because there's no, business, there's no business case for it, right? So who's gonna build a factory and have it run empty for a pandemic that might happen in five years or 10 years or 20 years? And so the thinking is how do you create some kind of ongoing basis, let's say for seasonal flu. That's why we have manufacturing here in factories, but they don't have those programs in a lot of low-income countries that you can switch these quickly to pandemic flu. How do you actually surge? It's almost like surge supply. And what's the business case to keep those factories in place when they're gonna be empty for a long time? So I think that's been this, the, the sticking point. And on anti-vax sentiment, yeah, it's a global, it's a globalized phenomenon, but what you have seen, and this is also true in France, which usually has a quite kind of anti-vax sentiment, is the harder you're hit, the more you want vaccines. So I think the reason Britain took them up so quickly was we had lived through a horrible winter, remember? I mean, it was, I don't think anyone had a good time then. Um, so they, you basically had people who were desperate. They were like, we will do anything. We want to get out of this. And so you saw vaccine take up went up. I mean, 95, 98% in over 70s. I mean, astonishing. Where places that weren't hit, think of Australia at the start, were like, well, why should we get vaccines? Then Australia started getting hit, going into restrictions. People were like, give us the vaccines. <laughs> we'll take it. So I think my hope, my hope is that actually, again, if we can avoid some of the disinformation, misinformation online, that people will take vaccines um, if we can explain to them the benefits and how it is our way through this. And I, and I don't understand why it gets complicated because for me, it's just your body, trains your body how to fight the real thing. It's that simple. 
And so I don't know, sometimes we maybe overcomplicate talking about mRNA or adenovirus or this vector. I mean, it's quite simply just a trial for your body to learn how to fight it. I mean, I think that's the simplification. And on inequalities, yeah, I think the one thing that's been a universal phenomenon is it has increased inequalities in probably every single country between the rich and between the poor. The rich have got richer and the poor have got poorer. Um, and, um, and I don't know how we start to, to cope with that. We have many more new billionaires that have been created because of COVID. Um, and we have many more people who've been plunged into poverty and are using food banks. And I think that's the challenge of government to try to kind of start to try to pull those two ends together to more of a middle, to, to heal from this and recover because it's just made it worse. And that's true whether it's India, Nigeria, the States or Britain. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Debbie has just demonstrated, if I may say so, the skill of interdisciplinarity. <laughs> um, if I could turn back the clock 30 or 40 years, would you be my tutor? <laughs> Can you all join me, please, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking her for an extraordinary <laughs>